well, let me first begin by asking if there are any questions from members of the committee. Starts to this. I don't see any. Uh, and so then, oh, Senator Simpson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Rankin. What four states have already kind of progressed down this path, Senator Rankin? Give me just a moment to refer to my notes here. I'm literally running from one <laughs> committee to another. I'm referring to a report by the Nuclear Innovation Alliance, which reports on both federal law and pilot programs. Um, there's a repowering Wyoming communities with an advanced reactor, Utah advanced municipal power systems, Washington State's first of a kind initiative and nuclear power for Rio Blanco, uh, I'm sorry, for, for Puerto Rico. Uh, now the way this works is that DOE sponsors these programs and the state teams up with private industry to form a partnership and then a secure DOE funding for these pilot project, projects. So. Senator Rankin, so that's, these are above and beyond a study. This is actually commissioning the potential construction of if you small read, modular ones? It's a combination, uh, okay. Senator Simpson. They are both evaluating cost trade-offs and in some cases actually you know, develop, developing, doing the development work. Thank you, uh, Senator Rankin and Senator Simpson um, for that dialogue. Seeing no further questions from members of the committee, Senator, do you have a preference on uh, the order of either proponents or opponents that you'd like to bring forward? I do not, Madam Chair. I'd like to start with the proponents, uh, but I haven't had a chance to meet all my witnesses because I've been running across the street. So Certainly. No, I totally understand that and recognize that. In that case, um, I'll just go ahead and call uh, proponents in the... Um, uh, order in which y'all signed up. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, what I, for, for those of you all who um, haven't been here with us all afternoon <laughs> here at Senate State Affairs, um, we call folks in panels. Uh, and so I'll invite three names uh, to come up and testify. If you are here in person, please stick around at the witness stand. Um, because what we'll do is we'll hear, we'll invite each of you to say your name, any organization you represent, and then proceed to testimony. You will each have three minutes. For those of you who are testifying um, in person, you will see uh, a little box, a little black box on the witness table that has a green light. Green means go, yellow means you've got 30 seconds remaining. Red means please conclude your remarks. You'll also hear an auditory beep, um, uh, which is helpful, particularly for those of y'all who are uh, online and remote. What we'll do is we'll call these panels in, in uh, groups of three, and then at that point, we'll open up for questions from uh, members of the committee. And with that, um, I will go ahead and call up Ms. Alexandra Renner. Ms. Meredith Anglin and Mr. James Hoff. Welcome. Are you Ms. Uh, Renner? Okay. Welcome to Senate State Affairs. There's a little gray button at the base of that microphone. You want to click it to turn on the microphone. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Senate State Affairs. Please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. Sounds good. Um, my name is Alexandra Renner, and I'm here on behalf of Oklo Inc. Um, so first off, I'd like to start off by thanking the committee for having me here on behalf of OCLO to testify regarding this topic. Um, what I'd like to share with you all today is rooted both in my decade uh, in the energy sector as well as my decade here in the state of Colorado. 
My career started out in the federal government, and honestly, that's where I saw really the status quo, both on the nuclear power energy uh, industry, but also on energy as a whole. This first job essentially is what led me to my role now at Oklo. At Oklo, we're bringing the promise of the next generation of nuclear reactors, what we call advanced fission microreactors. I'm speaking to you all today because I believe these technologies could be a valuable tool in helping Colorado reach its energy goals. Oklo specializes in small facilities, which are on the order of one to 10 megawatts electric. Unlike the currently operating nuclear fleet, we can recycle, use nuclear fuel, and our facilities are very small in size and power output with a footprint of about one acre. So what this means is we have a reduced site footprint and no environmental impact, no water use, no noise, no pollution, and no ugly industrial complex. Our facilities and advanced vision as a whole are the cleanest, most efficient way of producing much needed carbon-free energy. This bill is really near and dear to me as I've been a dedicated resident here for a decade. I've lived in Douglas, El Paso, and now Summit County. In Summit County especially, I've been observing changes, socioeconomic, as well as the growing impacts of climate change. The reality is the state is becoming more and more populated and we need, a, we need more energy. We're also witnessing the rapid shift of our climate. Winter weather is starting later, and unfortunately, uh, our summers are now blanketed in smoke. While similar events are occurring across the country, Colorado's economy is heavily dependent on the great outdoors. So this is a key example of where advanced vision, such as ours, can deliver on the state's clean energy goals, especially in tough site areas, where as mentioned before, solar and wind may fall short, or where there are targets to replace fossil fuels as baseline. Generally, I'm proud of the commitments our state has made to address climate change, such as the aggressive goal to reduce emissions by at least 90% by 2050, from the levels that existed in 2005, among others in Colorado's Climate Action Plan, not to mention the greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse gas Pollution Reduction Roadmap. So this is where energy resources, such as Oklahoma, can fill the gap, both for electrification and for climate. The, the bill in front of you today seeks to explore what's possible, and I urge you to take the next step forward. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Ms. Renner, for sharing your testimony with us. Um, have you testified before the legislature before? Uh, no, not on this one. Dude, welcome to uh, State Affairs. Good times. <laughs> For first time on the state. Awesome. Um, well, we love to hear it. Um, I'm going to, before you, um, uh, before we open up to questions, I'm going to also welcome Ms. Meredith Anglin, who is not online. I'm going to skip then to Mr. Hopps. And then I will bring up on deck Mr. Arthur Hyde, and then we'll open up for questions. Mr. Hopp, um, welcome. Please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, my name is James Hoff. I'm with uh, Generation Atomic, a grassroots uh, nuclear advocacy organization. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for the great opportunity to speak in support of this important bill. A small modular reactor feasibility study would be a low cost, no regrets measure that would keep the option open for new nuclear as part of a future carbon-free power grid. Consensus among experts, including the IPCC, is that nuclear will need to play a significant role in any future carbon-free power grid. All of the scenarios analyzed by the IPCC that actually achieved deep decarbonization relied on a significant increase in nuclear power generation. Analyses, analyses show that a mixture of nuclear and renewable generation would provide reliable power at a much lower cost than an all renewable grid because it would require far, a far smaller amount of expensive, very large scale, long-term electricity storage. Not keeping the nuclear power option open would amount to a risky gamble that some major electricity storage breakthrough occurs that would allow affordable electricity storage on the scale required for an all renewable grid. There are no objective reasons for even trying to exclude nuclear. Scientific analyses done by formal scientific bodies have shown that nuclear power's climate impacts and its public health and safety risks 
are negligible compared to those of fossil fuel generation and are similar to those posed by solar and wind generation. Um, it should also be noted that due to a lot of the facts above, there has been a remarkable growth in support for nuclear power in recent years, particularly among Democrats. For example, the Biden administration has come out in strong support of nuclear power. Advanced reactors and SMRs offer even better environmental performance than current plants do. They will be even safer than current reactors by orders of magnitude. Due to fundal char fundamental characteristics of these reactor designs, the probability of a serious accident is orders of magnitude smaller for SMRs. Also, even if such an accident were to occur, the maximum potential release would be far smaller due to SMR's much smaller size. As a result, significant impacts outside the plant site boundary are not expected, even in the case of a serious accident. In terms of economics, SMRs may offer lower costs and lower financial risks than current large reactors. Centralized factory construction of large numbers of identical SMR modules is expected to greatly reduce costs, just as it did for wind and solar. Finally, SMRs can be used as a replacement for retiring coal plants. This option offers a great opportunity for a truly just transition to a carbon-free grid for fossil work. Thank um, you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Hopp, for sharing uh, your comments with the committee. Uh, you can go ahead and wrap up the sentence that you were on. Thank you. Okay, one final thing. Also, these would be stable, long-term jobs that would remain in their local community for many decades. So this is something that fossil fuel workers really like, and that's why you see all these coal to nuclear projects being enthusiastically embraced. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hotz. Um, and then last up on this panel, I'll welcome Mr. Hyde. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee, for allowing me to speak to you today. My name is Arthur Hyde and I'm a partner at Segra Capital Management. Our firm focuses on investments which support the global clean energy transition. I co-manage the firm's nuclear power and fuel cycle focused investments. and currently have over 250 million invested in the nuclear power industry. Over the next several years, we intend to invest significantly more into the advanced nuclear power space. We believe that nuclear power is, a criti is critical to the nation's clean energy infrastructure and that investments in advanced nuclear strongly support a nation's environmental, economic, and national security objectives. Today, nuclear power is the largest source of clean energy in the United States, making up approximately 52% of low carbon generation. Our nation is home to the world's most effective nuclear operators with a fleet capacity factored in excess of 92%. That reliability makes clean baseload power the often overlooked workhorse of our electrical grids. Where nuclear plants are located, they're often the backbone of the local economy. Extensive polling across the nation has shown that communities closest to nuclear plant plants tend to have the highest approval ratings for the technology. Local communities have a better understanding of the industry's immaculate safety record and are direct beneficiaries of the economic opportunities that a plant provides. Nuclear power plants provide high skill high wage jobs, many of which are union represented. We often describe nuclear power plants as generational assets. That is because with a 60 plus year operating life, Nuclear plants are one of the few infrastructure assets where an operator's job will likely still be there for his grandchildren long after they retire. Advanced nuclear designs build on the excellent track record of the current industry, along with decades of research and development by some of the nation's brightest minds through our national labs programs. In addition to being smaller and more operationally flexible, many reactor designs utilize different fuels, coolants, moderators, and processes to provide solutions that current nuclear reactors simply cannot. Some benefits include improved economics through modular build plans and factory fabrication, inherent safety by design utilizing passive safety systems and lower operating pressures, load following capability to help balance intermittent renewables on grid, high heat systems to decarbonize industrial processes, integrated hydrogen and desalination opportunities, and significantly reduced nuclear waste profiles with many designs able to use existing nuclear waste as a fuel. Today, nuclear support has become a bipartisan issue in Washington for the first time in close to 40 years. Representatives on both sides of the aisle are beginning to understand the importance of investing in a clean energy future through nuclear power. State level programs and research are an essential part of this opportunity. We've started to see states across the nation who recognize the environmental and economic promise of advanced nuclear move forward with studies, siting, and even early permitting for new reactors. Given the future technology, 
like this are often factory built, early adopters who begin developing expertise early should see outsized returns on that investment as the industry scales towards commercialization. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. That was right on time, sir, thank you. Um, colleagues, I will now um, open this panel of witnesses up for questions. Any questions for either or any of these witnesses? Seeing none, I wanna thank you all for joining us uh, this evening as we uh, consider the merits of the policy. Thank you. Next up, I'd like to call Dr. Patrick White, Mr. Stephen Curtis, and Christopher Barnard. Dr. White, welcome to Senate State Affairs. If you could please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. You'll have three minutes. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Patrick White, and I'm a project manager with the Nuclear Innovation Alliance, a nonprofit, nonpartisan think and do tank focused on creating the conditions for success for advanced nuclear energy, specifically as a climate solution. I appreciate the opportunity to provide comments on Senate Bill 73 and on small modular reactors more broadly. Small modular reactors, or SMRs, are a potential paradigm shift for the use of nuclear energy here in Colorado, nationwide, and around the world. While conventional light water nuclear reactors currently in operation in the United States today produce reliable, carbon-free energy and are safe to operate, they are also large, capital-intensive, and baseload electric generating units. These characteristics may limit their ability to integrate into future energy systems with large percentages of variable renewable energy sources and the need to provide reliable carbon-free energy for heating, transportation, and industrial processes. SMRs are a nimbler approach to carbon-free nuclear energy. These SMRs may leverage existing light water technology or other advanced reactor technologies, each with unique safety and operational attributes. Some examples of non-light water technologies currently under development in the United States for SMRs include high temperature gas reactors and sodium fast reactors. These SMRs are obviously smaller than conven conventional nuclear reactors, but this reduced size has several significant operational and safety advantages. The smaller size and a focus on flexible operations allows SMRs to effectively match changing energy demands and renewable energy generation throughout the day, week, and year without the need for large amounts of energy storage. Numerous academic studies have found that including firm clean energy sources like SMRs can significantly reduce the cost of energy from 100% clean energy systems. Small modular reactors also enable modular addition of nuclear energy capacity that can more efficiently meet the increasing energy needs of communities over time. The size and modularity of these new reactors enable the factory manufacturing of reactor modules and can reduce the time needed on site for construction and installation as compared with conventional nuclear energy. The small reactor size and a developer emphasis on inherent safety may simplify the siting requirements from SMRs and reduce the burden on surrounding communities related to emergency planning. Advanced reactors will still be subject to review by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and will meet or outperform the safety standards for nuclear energy in the United States. And finally, while we tend to focus on decarbonizing our electricity sector, decarbonizing all major energy uses will be needed to help mitigate climate change. SMRs can help provide clean, reliable, carbon-free energy, heat, and electricity to a wide variety of energy sectors, including residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation that were historically powered by natural gas or other fossil fuels. SMRs could readily integrate with solar, wind, hydroelectric, and other zero carbon energy sources as part of a broader clean energy strategy for Colorado. A variety of potential advanced reactor technologies are currently under development by companies across the United States and will be ready for commercial deployment by the end of this decade. The SMR feasibility study in Senate Bill 73 will help provide Coloradans with the information on how SMRs could help supply the state with safe, clean, reliable, and affordable energy. Thank you so much, Dr. White, um, for sharing that perspective. I'm going to shift now to Mr. Stephen Curtis. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I appreciate your allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Steve Curtis, and I'm representing a grassroots organization uh, called WasteEnergy.org. And I'm here to support this bill because I think it's extremely important that new energy sources be found for ever increasing energy supply, especially clean baseload energy sources. 
Such a source would be something called uh, recycling used nuclear fuel and fast reactors. This is a mature technology, and there are at least five companies now privately capitalized in the United States to produce and develop and manufacture these types of reactors. So consider this. This type of energy would supply 100, it would be a 100% domestic supply of energy. It would be 100% clean because this material has already been mined. Uh, there's enough of this material existing now in the United States to uh, power the United States, all the United States needs for 250 years. If, if, you, if a state was able to leverage this technology, they could um, make use of the currently $45 billion Congressional Nuclear Waste Fund to work with industry to help develop that in partnership. They, they, further, if the state became a consent state to accept used nuclear fuel for recycling, it could uh, basically define its own uh, benefits, is what the government has said, which I recommend to be a tech transfer national laboratory de designation working with uh, an industrial park full of these. There's now 50 small modular reactor privately capitalized companies could work on this industrial park. And actually, they would manufacture these uh, reactors in the central location and ship them to the rest of the world, basically. This is an intrinsically safe technology, which means it's even safer than the light water reactor uh, energy that we have today, reactors that we have today, which enjoy the best industrial safety record of any U.S. industry. So in summary, I'd like to say uh, that fast reactor is a type of small modular reactor that allow the use of spent nuclear fuel which some call waste, although I don't know why, to power the grid while disposing of this material. I do not see what better alternative energy source you could imagine than one that is, would clean up a current situation that hasn't been solved in 40 years while providing uh, the grid with 100% clean, 100% domestic, and 100% baseload energy. I encourage you to do this study, and I would hope that you would include this technology as part of your study. Thank you for your time. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Curtis. And the last person on this panel is Mr. Christopher Barnard. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee, and also Senator Rankin and Representative McKean for sponsoring today's bill. Uh, my name is Christopher Barnard. I am the National Policy Director for the American Conservation Coalition the nation's largest right of center grassroots environmental organization. My work focuses on analyzing policies that can help us tackle climate change while creating a strong economy. I believe that Senate Bill 2273 meets both of these criteria. In particular, I'd like to focus my testimony on the benefits that next generation nuclear energy can bring to the state of Colorado. Nuclear energy is already crucial to the United States, as you've already heard tonight. It provides 20% of all American energy production and is our largest source of carbon-free power. It is also our most reliable source of energy, capable of operating 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Unfortunately, however, nuclear energy has been falling behind, dropping by nearly 50% in terms of global energy production since 2006. Of the 55 plants in operation in the United States, around half are at risk of early retirement while 12 reactors have already been closed since 2012. As a young person, this worries me. I believe we have a duty to tackle climate change and reduce our levels of carbon pollution. Closing nuclear plants pushes us in the wrong direction. But as a policy analyst, I see an opportunity for new and innovative technologies to shape the future and for American innovation to lead the world. I believe that small modular reactors or SMRs provide that opportunity. Because of their smaller size, most SMR parts can be factory made offsite and then shipped to the reactor's location. Smaller reactors also require less upfront funding, making them more affordable. Finally, these new reactors have significant safety improvements using state-of-the-art technology to make them the safest form of energy production in the country. Small modular reactors are already bringing economic opportunity to other Western states. In Idaho, new scale powers SMRs will sustain nearly 13,000 jobs and provide clean electricity for over half a million homes. In Wyoming, Terra Power's proposed project would create nearly 5,000 jobs and produce power for up to 400,000 homes. 
Last year, Montana's state Senate approved a study on retrofitting old coal plants with SMRs. Ultimately, I believe that Senate Bill 2273 will not only put Colorado on the forefront of clean energy innovation, but it also opens the door for significant investment in this beautiful state. To me, that sounds like a win-win for both the people and for the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Barnard. At this time, colleagues, I will open up this panel for questions from members of the committee. Seeing none, we really appreciate your comments as we deliberate the, the merits of this policy. Thank you. I'm gonna call up our next uh, panel. I'm gonna welcome Ms. Sarah Jensen, Ms. Alyssa Hayes, and Mr. Roan Brown. Ms. Jensen, welcome to Senate State Affairs. If you could please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. Thank you so much. Good evening, Madam Good Chair evening. Gonzalez, Ranking Member Sonnenberg, and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Jensen, and I'm a grassroots ambassador for the American Conservation Coalition here in Colorado. I am also a student at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I am studying for a master's in environmental and natural resource policy. I am testifying today in favor of Senate Bill 2273, because I believe that the opportunities and benefits of advanced nuclear reactors for the state of Colorado are crucial to meeting our climate goals and providing economic opportunity to hardworking Coloradans. I actually grew up in California, a state that prides itself on its very ambitious climate plans. But unfortunately, as a young person concerned about climate change, I've been disappointed by my state's failed energy policies. Not only does California have the highest energy prices in the country and experiences rolling blackouts, it's also on track to fail its own climate goals. Why? Because we shut down our nuclear power plants. In 2012, California closed the San Onofre nuclear reactors carbon emissions in the state rose by 35% that year. By 2025, the state is set to close its last remaining nuclear power plant at Diablo Canyon, which provides 8% of all energy to the state and 15% of its clean energy. Emissions are expected to rise again. Why do I mention this? To me, as a young climate activist, California is a cautionary tale of what happens when legislators make laws on the basis of fear and fiction rather than fact. I moved to Colorado a couple of years ago, excited to live and study in such a beautiful state where actionable steps were being taken to protect the environment and the economy for my generation and the generations to come. I fell in love with this state, its people and the incredible outdoors it has to offer. I do not want Colorado to make the same mistakes as my home state of California. While Colorado has also adopted some of the most ambitious climate goals in the country, these must now be followed up with common sense action. Every single day, I work and study with young people who are worried about the future of our planet and are desperate for solutions. We understand that some people are concerned about the risks associated with nuclear energy, but we also understand, understand the scale of the problem we face. And that's exactly why we are so excited about the future of next generation nuclear plants. With these newer, safer technologies, young people realize that we have a real opportunity in Colorado to produce clean, safe, and reliable nuclear energy. Senate Bill 2273 will position Colorado to become a leader on this innovative technology, supplying clean energy and supporting a strong economy for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective with us. Um, before we go to questions, I'm going to bring up Ms. Alyssa Hayes. Welcome to Senate State Affairs. If you could please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. Good evening. Uh, firstly, I would like to deeply thank Senator Rankin and Representative McKean for sponsoring this bill. I myself am a Democrat, and I believe that nuclear energy is a bipartisan issue that can bring us together in the name of providing clean, reliable, and affordable energy. 
My name is Alyssa Hayes, and I am a nuclear engineering PhD candidate at the University of Tennessee, and I do not have any ties to industry. However, today I am advocating for you to fund the SMR feasibility study as a representative of the grassroots organization Generation Atomic, simply because I am an environmentalist. I believe in Colorado's ability to become a leader in implementing low carbon technologies and paving the way for nuclear to become a part of the climate solution. Colorado electricity generation is already 36% renewable, most of which is coming from wind energy. Of course, we use energy not just in the form of electricity, but also for industry, transportation, and residential and commercial heating and cooling as well. In the end, only 8% of all total energy consumed in the state of Colorado comes from non-combustible renewables. Um, while nuclear plants can certainly contribute to the Colorado electric grid, as they already do across the nation, um, there is enormous potential for SMRs to generate heat for use in residential and commercial buildings and heat for industrial manufacturing. There are also many other environmental benefits offered by nuclear over other non-carbon emitting technologies. Nuclear does not require intense battery storage. It is the least mining intensive. It requires the fewest materials and it is by far the least land intensive of any low carbon power source, which also means that nuclear has the smallest impact on local wildlife. Um, and of course, this study is specific to small modular reactors, which can be standardized, factory built and shipped across the country on a truck. Um, many previous studies predict that SMRs because of these, you know, um, features will be significantly more affordable than existing thousand megawatt nuclear plants. So no other technology, in my opinion, is more deserving of a feasibility study such as the one proposed in this bill. Um, one of the greatest benefits of nuclear power is that it is more reliable, as others have said, with a capacity factor of 90% nationwide, meaning that it's producing 90% of the time. Uh, because obviously the wind doesn't always blow, uh, you would have to build over 800 one megawatt wind turbines with a 33% capacity factor to achieve the same generation as a single 300 megawatt small modular nuclear power plant. Uh, the expansion of wind energy has come a very long way in Colorado, and I applaud you and the wind industry for achieving the renewable portfolio standard goal of a 30% renewable electricity grid, but the climate crisis does not allow us to stop there. The most effective strategy to achieve net zero is to adopt an all of the above mindset, and nuclear power can be a part of that solution. Thank you so much for your time, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hayes. That was right on time as well. Um, the last person um, we'll, call, we'll call up is Mr. Ron, Ron Brown. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Is it Ron or is it Ron? Uh, you're correct, uh, my name is pronounced Ron. Um, Ron. Welcome, hey. sir. Thank you so, Thank so you. much for joining us. If you could please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. Uh, I'm Ron Brown. I'm representing myself. I'm a retired mechanical engineer with a Master of Science degree in engineering from Colorado State University. I became a registered professional engineer 50 years ago. I retired after more than 40 year uh, consulting, primarily in the aerospace industry, doing structural analysis. My last contract was with a Department of Energy contractor licensing the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Project in Nevada. I am an active Democrat. I am in favor of Senate Bill 22-73 to study the use of SMRs in Colorado. This is an overdue reconsideration of nuclear energy in Colorado. Quite frankly, we in the United States are falling behind Europe and especially China in technology we invented. If we look objectively at nuclear energy, one can see that it already has on a per kilowatt hour basis, the lowest resource use, the lowest CO2 emission, the lowest pollution, the lowest waste volume, the lowest waste toxicity, the lowest land use, the, and the lowest death rate per megawatt hour. Nuclear plant, power plants in comparison to others have the highest capacity factor, highest productivity, longest plant lifetimes, and the highest pay rate per person. Nuclear energy is a renewable energy source. The first 
Six points are a direct result of the fact from physics, nuclear reaction is 60 million times higher energy density than a chemical reaction, and there is no carbon burning. If safety is defined from death rate, then commercial nuclear energy production in the United States is already infinitely safe. It's just math, a large number divided by zero tends to infinity. Nuclear energy can be renewable because the fuel, fuel can be economically recovered from seawater and that resource is constantly renewed by water runoff. All forms of energy production produce waste. Nuclear waste is radioactive, but we know how to safely handle it using adequate shielding. Look at the whole picture and compare the relative details. Going to advance the nuclear only improves on these points. There are several points, higher burn up, passive design features, the reactors can be passively, that can be walk away safe. In other words, there's no uh, operator required for shutdown. Small modular reactors, as mentioned, is a class of advanced reactors that address the build cost by mass producing smaller reactors in a factory and trucking them in a assembled reactor to a site. Uh, because of these points, nuclear energy and small modular reactors should be part of the mix in addressing our climate problems in the United States and Colorado. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Brown. I, I thank you for correcting me on how best to pronounce your name. Um, at this time, I'm going to open up this panel of Ms. Jensen, Ms. Hayes, and Mr. Brown for questions from members of the committee. I see no questions for you all at this time, but I'm very grateful that you've taken to share your thoughts with us as we deliberate this bill. Thank you. Uh, next up, I'm going to call Mr. Connor Woodrich, Dr. Michael Fox, and Mr. Alex Gilbert. Mr. Woodrich, welcome to Senate State Affairs. If you could please uh, state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Connor Woodrich. I'm representing the Nuclear Energy Institute. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I speak today in support of Senate Bill 73. Although I represent NEI in Washington, D.C., I'm a graduate of CU Boulder and former longtime Denver resident. NEI is a trade organization that represents companies associated with the nuclear industry, universities, research laboratories, law firms, labor unions, and electric utilities. Our members total more than 300 and come from 17 different countries. The nuclear industry in America is an enormous economic and carbon-free engine. In fact, 93 reactors employ more than 100,000 workers, produce 20% of the nation's electricity, and make up half of all carbon-free electric generation. While Colorado does not currently have any reactors, the industry has a long history of safe and successful nuclear operations. Nuclear plays an important role in our energy transition, ensuring that we all have equitable access to affordable and reliable electricity. Nuclear power is a natural partner with wind and solar. It has the highest capacity factor of any, any energy source, is available 24 seven, and saves consumers an average of 6% on their electric bills. Reactors typically need to refuel every 18 to 24 months, but some advanced reactor designs are capable of even longer periods without needing to refuel. This natural partnership between nuclear and renewable sources will help Colorado deliver on its commitment to ensure 100% of electricity production is carbon-free by 2050. Although reactor designs vary by de developer, their myriad of benefits have attracted considerable attention from industries and governments interested in reliable carbon-free power. The common theme of these advanced reactors is that they are smaller and more simple than nuclear plants in operation today, which leads to enhanced safety, greater cost competitive, and greater cost competitiveness. The variety of designs is creating a portfolio of products able to meet a diverse set of market and customer needs. Not only are advanced reactors an excellent addition to the electric grid, they can also produce heat for industrial processes or generating hydrogen and can be deployed in remote locations for isolated communities or mining operations. As coal plants continue to shut down, people are looking at advanced reactors to reuse the valuable transmission infrastructure left behind and for restoring jobs in the economy in the surrounding community. A handful of advanced reactors are already moving forward for commercial demonstrations this decade, enabling large-scale deployment in the 2030s. Like was found by a recent E3 study in Washington State, 
many utilities and policymakers are coming to the realization that a clean, reliable, and affordable energy supply in the U.S. can only be obtained when advanced reactors are included, along with renewables and other zero carbon sources. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to speak before you today. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Woodridge, uh, for sharing your perspective. I'm going to next turn to Dr. Fox. Whoops, sir, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, welcome to oh, Senate I'm State sorry. Affairs. <laughs> You're all good. Welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you. Madam uh, please Chairman. state your name and any organization you represent and proceed. Thank you. Madam Chair Gonzalez, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Dr. Mike Fox. I'm a retired emeritus professor of environmental and radiological health sciences at CSU, but I am re representing myself, not CSU. I wrote a book about nuclear power and the environment. And I'd love to give my standard hour lecture on this topic, but luckily for you, I only have three minutes. <laughs> I'm here to support this bill because it's getting harder and harder to deny that global warming is an extremely serious problem as exemplified by the recent wildfires in Colorado and indeed the whole West. And the fact just published that we are in a 1500 year mega drought in the Southwest. Coal-fired power plants are a major contributor to carbon dioxide production in the US and the world and carbon dioxide is the major contributor to global warming. Getting rid of coal plants is essential to minimize global warming. Nuclear power has provided approximately 20% of electricity in the United States for the last nearly 30 years, and states that have nuclear power are much less dependent on coal. For example, in 2019, before the pandemic kind of messed the, everything up, the US averaged 27% of coal for electricity production while in Colorado, we required 45% coal. Small modular reactors can replace coal-fired power plants and still provide the essential baseload power that we're dependent on 24 hours a day, which wind and solar are not good at. They can balance out the instabilities caused by intermittency of solar and wind capacity on the network. They can also provide good long-term jobs in places like Craig that are losing their coal-fired power plant. In Kimmer or Wyoming, they plan to replace a similar coal-fired power plant with a small modular reactor called Natrium to be built by Bill Gates' company, TerraPower. Another advantage of SMRs is that they can use the infrastructure at a coal plant, such as power lines and cooling water. Also, SMRs are designed to be intrinsically safer than current reactors, partly by not requiring cooling pumps and electricity to safely shut down in an emergency. Finally, I would like to comment on the definition of small modular reactors in section 1.1a in the bill. It considers an SMR to be, quote, not more than 300 megawatts of electricity. This is the definition by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that regulates nuclear reactors dating back 10 or 15 years or so. However, the two SMRs in the US likely to be commercially available in the near future are the new scale reactor that's already been approved by the NRC and the natrium reactor by TerraPower. The new scale reactor has modules of 77 megawatts electrical and a standard configuration would be four modules for 308 megawatts, while the natrium reactor is designed for 342 megawatts and surges to about 500 megawatts, which can be used to balance fluctuations in wind energy. Thus, I would recommend that you amend the wording to be not more than 500 megawatts of electricity. Thank you so much, Dr. Fox, uh, for sharing that really detailed testimony. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm going to next uh, turn to Mr. Alex Gilbert to round out uh, this panel. Oh, oh I, he is not online. Okay. Um, in that case, I will see um, if there are any questions for any of the um, witnesses that we've just heard from in this panel. Seeing none, I want to thank you for joining and sharing your uh, comments with us as we deliberate the merits of this policy. Thank you. Next, I'm going to shift over to uh, Mr. Nicholas McMurray, Ms. Madison Hilly, and Mr. Philip Ord.
Welcome to Senate State Affairs. Uh, could I bring the microphone a bit closer? Yes, certainly. Could you move it? Closer Senator Rankin, can you please? Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Test. Okay. All right. Now we got you. Welcome to Senate State Affairs. If you could please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. Great. Thank you. Hello, and thanks for allowing my testimony. My name is Phil Ward, president of the pro-nuclear advocacy group, Americans for Nuclear Energy. We take no money from the nuclear industry or special interest groups. I am here today to argue for proposed bill 073, which will require a study into viability of small modular nuclear reactors, SMRs, as a replacement to fossil fuels. Right now, we are in an unprecedented time with a looming climate crisis breathing down our necks. It is mandatory that we move away from fossil fuels to prevent unmanageable amounts of global heating and overall climate and ecological breakdown. We need to do, we need whatever carbon-free technology we can get to decarbonize the energy sector. Nuclear power is probably the greatest tool we have to drive emissions to zero. In fact, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says we must at least double nuclear capacity worldwide to limit to two degrees Celsius warming. Climatologist Dr. James Hansen of NASA also agrees with this assessment. Why is nuclear important and necessary? One reason is that only electric grid, that the only electric grids known to decarbonize above 90% are powered with mostly hydroelectric and or nuclear power. Places like this include France, Ontario, Norway, Sweden, Washington State, and Costa Rica. Also, nuclear power is available on demand, erasing the need for expensive storage technology required for intermittent power sources. Nuclear's reliability keeps grids strong, robust, and blackout resistant. It's one of the most environmentally low impact sources of energy. It needs tiny amounts of fuel and mining, uses tiny amounts of land, uses tiny quantities of materials per unit energy, produces tiny amounts of contained waste, and produces no air pollution or greenhouse gases. Next generation SMRs are very exciting. Main sections, Many sections of these power plants can be mass produced in factories and then shipped to the site, dramatically lowering the cost of construction. They're also built with passive safety features, meaning they require no human intervention to return the reactor to safe shutdown during an emergency. They can be sited much easier without empty space requirements needed by current nuclear power plants. Companies are right, right now have received or almost received NRC approval and are ready to gen, gen, demonstrate technology. Examples include Oklo, New Skill, X Energy, and Terrestrial Energy. The feasibility study is needed to help the state of Colorado remain a clean energy leader in the country. We can end all electricity related emissions before 2050. SMRs will be needed to make this happen. I'm a young person who is very much concerned about climate change. The potential of SMRs gives me hope. We can have a stable climate, a healthy environment, and a robust high tech economy at the same time. This is why I implore you to bring this bill to the Senate floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ord, for sharing your perspective with uh, the committee. Don't, um, don't go away quite yet um, because we are next gonna turn to Mr. McMurray. Mr. McMurray, welcome to Senate State Affairs. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, well, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Nico McMurray, and I'm the Managing Director of Public Policy at ClearPath Action. ClearPath Action is a Washington, D.C.-based organization advancing federal policies that accelerate breakthrough innovations to reduce emissions in the energy and industrial sectors. I'm here to support this bill because Colorado has regularly been on the leading edge of clean energy policy. While there's no silver bullet that will solve the urgent climate challenge, Accelerating the global deployment of American advanced nuclear reactors will significantly reduce emissions and meet growing energy. Dozens of American entrepreneurs are developing advanced nuclear technologies and are racing towards deploying them. In fact, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission could receive roughly 10 new license applications before 2025. These next generation reactors are on the cusp of being built. These technologies provide clean, reliable power create jobs in local communities, and also offer additional benefits relative to traditional reactors. They are smaller, which allows them to be sited in new locations, 
They can operate flexibly to complement renewable energy. They're a walkway safe and they can decarbonize industries beyond the power sector with their high temperature heat and steam. In other words, these technologies are new breeder reactors, much different than the current nuclear fleet. Projects are built at the state level, and this bill provides Colorado the opportunity to understand the rapidly changing landscape of advanced nuclear technologies, educate policymakers on the numerous projects throughout the US and in Canada, and determine the role that these new technologies can play in the state of Colorado. There is a lot of federal momentum and bipartisan support for these technologies. In addition, neighboring states like Wyoming are looking at advanced nuclear, specifically citing an advanced nuclear reactor at a retiring plant in Kemner, Washington, preserving the local jobs and tax base of that community. One comment on the legislation is that the term small modular reactor shouldn't prohibit considering advanced or non-water cooled reactors as part of the feasibility study. This broader view can further expand the variety of technologies to consider including some technologies which build off the legacy of the Fort Thane Brain Reactor, which operated in Colorado in the 1980s. This bill provides Colorado the opportunity to lead again on advanced nuclear, and I urge you to support it. Thank you for the opportunity today. Clear Path Action greatly appreciates the committee considering this piece of legislation, and I look forward to answering any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. McMurray. Um, the last person we have on this panel is Ms. Madison Hilly. Good evening. My name is Madison Hilly, and I am the founder and the executive director of the Campaign for a Green Nuclear Deal, an industry independent research and policy organization. I've spent the last five years protecting nuclear power plants from premature closure. Now I'm advocating for the expansion of nuclear power in America as a way of creating dignified high wage jobs and tackling the climate crisis. In many energy communities across Colorado, coal plants have been the economic engines to provide concentrated employment opportunities and wealth. However, these jobs have been in severe decline for over a decade mostly due to a sharp increase in the cost of coal power compared to natural gas. Most energy experts believe that in order to lower carbon emissions, we will need to deliver even more energy through the electrical grid. However, the desire to lower carbon emissions will limit the ability of existing coal plants to take advantage of higher load growth. As such, energy communities with retiring coal plants are facing the loss of tax revenues, jobs and purpose. Most focus from energy policy and the nonprofit sector has focused on the replacement of coal with renewable energy. However, solar and wind facilities take hundreds of times more area than gas, coal or nuclear plants to make similar amounts of energy while offering a hundredth of the continuing employment of a coal or nuclear plant to make that power. Fortunately, what these communities love about coal can be provided by carbon-free nuclear energy. Better yet, many of the environmental and health concerns are solved with nuclear. As many communities around the US have come to understand, despite its reputation, there are practically no downsides to hosting a nuclear power plant. In fact, a survey of Americans shows that the strongest support for nuclear comes from those who live closest to the nuclear power plants. Repowering coal plants with nuclear would maintain and expand the existing workforce in Colorado. And nuclear plants today that are built today are expected to last at least 80 years. This means that communities can plan for nearly a century of steady income and employment, making it possible to get the best of everything on offer to small towns in America, from schools to roads and parks to hospitals for existing residents. Already, coal communities across the nation, including in Wyoming, West Virginia, and Montana, are exploring the option of placing small nuclear reactors on retiring coal sites. I believe that successfully building nuclear plants in former coal communities will happen when those communities can have an informed discussion and come together to decide if this is the right path for them. This bill will start that conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Ms. Hilly. Colleagues, any questions for this panel of witnesses? 
Seeing none, I want to thank you all so much for um, sharing your perspectives as we uh, consider this policy. Thank you. Next up, I'm going to welcome uh, Senator Brophy, Mr. C Timothy Coleman, and Mr. Eric Meyer. Welcome to Senate State Affairs. Uh, please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Greg Brophy. I am the Colorado Director of the Western Way. The Western Way is an organization that believes in free market solutions for our environmental challenges. And, and we support this bill and ask for a yes vote on it. Um, the, the nuclear side of it would provide an important base load uh, that is completely carbon free. And if the goal of the state of Colorado is to get to carbon free electricity generation, I can't think of a way to do it without adding a reliable base load generation for electricity like nuclear and the small modular nuclear advances that they're making uh, seem to fit exactly that bill. But I also want to talk about the second half of the bill that no one else has addressed yet as far as I'm aware. Pumped hydro storage is quite possibly the best battery known to us. You know, we are rapidly approaching 80 percent um, electricity generation from renewable resources. The best way to store that renewable energy that's created in the evenings or at night is to, is to store it by pumping water uphill and then let that water out when the sun goes down and often right at dusk is when the wind also stops blowing, at least temporarily, on the eastern plains. If there's ever a time, Senator Sonnenberg, that the wind is not going to blow at home, it will be early in the morning or at evening. That's why pumped hydro storage is such a great fit to, to, to link up with the renewable energy resources that we're building across eastern Colorado. And that's why I would encourage you all to support this bill and move it forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for uh, coming and sharing your perspective uh, with us. Mr. Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Committee. Uh, thank you, Senator Rankin, for bringing this important piece of legislation. My name is Tim Coleman. I'm the Manager of Legislative Affairs for the Colorado Rural Electric Association. Uh, CREA represents the 22 distribution cooperatives that operate here in Colorado, as well as Tri-State Generation and Transmission Cooperative. Uh, we cover about 70% of the land mass in the state and provide electricity to about one and a half million consumers throughout Colorado. Colorado's electric cooperatives are leading a way for a, for a more sustainable future, and we are committed to maintaining reliability, affordability, advancing innovative solutions, and enhancing community resilience. Uh, we believe that Senate Bill 73 is an opportunity for the state to lead the way in advancing innovative solutions as we continue to strive to meet our emissions reduction goals and those uh, associated coal power plant closures. One of the main concerns of the utility sector is how do we maintain reliability without that baseload. Uh, we believe that the small modular nuclear reactors is part of that solution um, and that should be incentivized and furthermore, as Senator Brophy mentioned, the uh, pumped hydro is also uh, a great resource that the utilities can use uh, to meet our emissions reduction goals when, those, uh, when the solar and wind curtails. And with that, uh, we have had a lot of testimony, and I'm sure there's more to come. So I would encourage the committee to vote yes on Senate Bill 73. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Coleman. Uh, I'm sure the vice chair appreciates your tocayo, your twin here. Uh, Mr. Meyer, welcome to Senate State Affairs. Mr. Eric Meyer. Oh, Mr. Meyer, paging Mr. Meyer. 
Click on the little accept to be promoted. And then we'll be able to hear your testimony. Ah, there you are. Hi, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Meyer, and uh, thank you for your service on uh, your city council and multitasking. I hear you on that, my friend. Uh, thank you so much. Um, colleagues, any questions for this panel of witnesses? I do have a question um, that I'm going to ask to uh, Mr. Coleman. And this is, um, I'm just, I'm curious for your perspective on why this would exist in OEDIT as opposed to another department. We don't have a preference in, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in terms of where the um, study comes from, I don't think that that is, is you know, ultimately where CREA's position um, relies on, but rather that the bill has the potential to promote um, these investments um, primarily in communities that um, will have uh, coal closures as well as um, you know where these jobs are created can have a, a vast economic um, implication. So from that perspective, I could see it making sense within OEDIT. Um, however, our primary focus is in uh, providing affordable and reliable um, electricity to our consumer members throughout Colorado. And um, this is a, a question. Is, is, is nuclear energy actually more affordable? I think that in long terms um, of, you know, when we're looking at our larger en energy portfolio, it has that potential to have a, you know, it would be comparable to a lot of the energy sources that are already out there um, at this time. And, you know, of course, there's going to be costs and in investments. 
you know, I think that ultimately, as we're looking at our changing energy landscape, we need to be considering all sorts of options, whether it's um, nuclear or pumped hydro or geothermal um, uh, generation as well. Thank you very much. Uh, that's helpful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, any other questions? Seeing none, I want to thank you all so much for sharing your perspectives. I'm going to welcome up Dr. Alexander uh, Canara, Mr. Ben Elwood, constituent, and oh, I think Ms. Renner signed up twice. Okay, hold on. And Ms. Claire. Dr. Canara? I don't see, I don't see, I don't, I, Mr. Casale is telling us that um, uh, Dr. Canara is not here. Online, um, we'll shift. Mr. Elwood, welcome to State Affairs. I thought I saw you here in person. Uh, yes, that's true. I was originally there in person and underestimated the, uh, the t personal time constraints. So I'm now here on Zoom. <laughs> well, welcome to State Affairs. <laughs> Please proceed, state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. and. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. It's good to see you both today. And uh, thank you to the committee as a whole. I appreciate uh, you giving me some time to speak. My name is Ben Elwood. And in addition to my job as a qualified X-ray inspector, I currently serve a number of volunteer positions within the Democratic Party, both in the county and state levels. Uh, but today I'm here as a uh, independent constituent on the issue of nuclear energy, a subject of great personal interest. And I have to say before I go on that uh, I have been absolutely blown away by the range and breadth of testimony given today um, on this bill, um, which transcends political boundaries. And I appreciate our Republican sponsors for bringing this opportunity forward. Um, I need not take up your time today by uh, going into any detail rev uh, regarding the environmental challenges that our state faces. I understand that there exists a considerable divide between our parties on how we are to clean up our air, safeguard our precious water resources and protect our wildlife. But today I am here to advocate for at least one policy proposal that I believe can bridge this divide by virtue of its sensibility, incorporating cutting edge nuclear energy into a clean energy portfolio. Um, and this is a subject that I have uh, debated with uh, some of my democratic colleagues at length. Um, but I have to say that the myths regarding nuclear energy are abound, and as a trained scientist myself, uh, I've come to understand that the majority of them are seriously exaggerated. If time permitted, I could go into greater detail, but suffice it to say that I believe we need to dispense with these fears, um, because as many of my colleagues have stated in other matters, we do need to remain flexible in the face of scientific data. And the issue at hand here today concerns small modular reactors. Uh, essentially many, many reactors that can be readily assembled at a factory, transported to its designated site, and by virtue of their flexibility and customizable size, they will prove to be feats of engineering, an impressive mixture of technological innovation and miniaturization. Their waste products will be even less than traditional reactors, making the issue less of a concern than it already is. Uh, some modern designs can even rely on coolants beyond water, making them viable in arid or semi-arid environments. Uh, most importantly, their construction costs and required capital might prove to be far less than traditional reactors, thereby eliminating one of the primary issues with nuclear plants. However, this last consideration uh, requires uh, some more information, and we could certainly benefit from some more cost-benefit analyses, and I think that is a great opportunity offered by this bill in particular. Colorado has an uh, initial opportunity to establish itself as a leading state in this promising new technology. The United States finds itself lagging behind Russia, China, and our European partners 
in the development and implementation of this technology. Um, but I believe that our state can uphold its growing reputation for legislative efficiency by moving this forward. I thank you all for your time, and I believe that the Office of Economic Development will produce some consequential results. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Elwood. Um, before we shift over to questions, I will hear from uh, Ms. Claire O'Brien. There's a little gray button. There you go. Um, Madam Chair Gonzalez, members of the committee, thank you for hearing me today. Uh, my name is Claire O'Brien, and I am representing Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center, and I am here to oppose Senate Bill 73, because I believe it is irresponsible to introduce an experimental and potentially dangerous technology into Colorado. Even if SMR technology was proven viable, something that has yet to happen, the waste that it produces will cause an ongoing disaster in our communities. In fact, the small modular design actually produces more waste per unit of electricity. There is nowhere in Colorado that deserves to take on the burden of nuclear waste. This is not a problem that can be solved, even with the highest levels of technology or budget, neither of which Colorado has or taxpayers should be burdened with. The only solution would be to outsource the waste to other communities, which would likely end up being a lower income marginalized one. The purpose of green and renewable energy is moving our world and country towards a more just and sustainable future. Creating radio radioactive waste that would exist for hundreds of thousands of years is the opposite of that. Our primary goal should be to solve climate-related issues for our future generations, not create more complex and hazardous ones. The federal government already has a track record of not taking responsibility for waste from other reactors in the country and has continued to pay fines for it. Additionally, nuclear power is not and should not be considered a green option for energy. The amount of water that is required for cooling is astronomical. While New Scale claims that they can reduce the amount of water needed, those claims are once again unsubstantiated. Colorado is clearly dealing with plenty of drought-related disasters, and we cannot afford to contaminate any more of our precious water. Overall, it is, a misle it is misleading to call nuclear power a truly green and sustainable option for our energy future. We are running out of time to come up with climate climate change solutions and wasting time and money on a dangerous and experimental technology would be moving us backwards, not forward. I urge you to oppose this bill and to explore truly green and renewable energy for Colorado's future. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. O'Brien. Um, I do, I do want to just be respectful and um, because I, I failed to catch here that um, uh, you had signed up well, online here, I, I have you signed up a, in a neutral position, but I'm recognizing your opposition to uh, the bill. I do want to just check in and see if there are any questions uh, for Mr. Elwood regarding his testimony. Seeing none, thank you so much, sir, for uh, joining us. And Ms. O'Brien, are there any questions for this witness? Seeing none, uh, appreciate. Uh, you coming and sharing your perspective. Um, colleagues, it is 645, and um, we do have um, quite a number of uh, people who are still here to testify, um, but I'm going to give us a brief just five-minute break um, to stand up and uh, move around, move about the cabin, as it were. Um, we will come back and reconvene at... 650. We'll stand in recess.
for your indulgence um, as we head into the evening portion of our committee hearing. Um, at this time, uh, I want to see if there are any, um, that concludes the list of proponents who had signed up to testify regarding uh, Senate Bill 73. And at this time, I'd like to see if there's anyone else in the audience who wishes to testify in support of Senate Bill 73 or anyone else online. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and at this time shift over uh, to hear from opposition. And I'd welcome up Ms. Uh, Elisaveta uh, Stacey Shin. Please um, correct me if I've mispronounced your name. Stacey Shin. Um, Ms. Jones Seaman and Mr. Mark Gwen. Ms. Uh, Elisaveta Stacy Shin, Ms. Joan Seaman, or Mr. Mark Glenn? Ms. Seaman, welcome to Senate State Affairs. Please state your name, any organization you may represent, and then proceed to testimony. You'll have three minutes to share your comments. Thank you. Hi, am I? Hi, on? are you able to hear me now? Oh. Yes, um, we're actually able to hear the both of you. So let's okay, <laughs> um, we'll go ahead and start off with uh, Ms. Joan Seaman and then we'll circle back to uh, Ms. Uh, Stacy Stacey Shin. Uh, this is Joan Seaman. And it's interesting to have this experience after all the years that I've worked on issues like Rocky Flats in my backyard and learning about Fort St. Vrain, where it has a monolith of waste that right now Denver Post has reported to the public that it has guards out there carrying submachine guns to keep us away from the nuclear waste that is in a monolith and it can't be taken out of here yet because there is no place to take the waste. Um, I tell you today, I feel like I there'll be people that can certainly talk to technical I can talk to technical, but right now I feel like I'm sitting in Pueblo, Colorado, the day that um, citizens weren't told or invited to a meeting, uh, it was invite only, to a meeting where Jen Jennifer Granholm had come in with new scale energy, new scale power energy to bring new sm small modular reactors to Pueblo. Now this happened to Tw Pueblo in 2011. But today I just feel like, whoa, we did we get blindsided with the entire Grand Home team? And so I wanted to say that right now um, we're learning a lot. It was interesting that Hugh McKean, apologies, Representative Hugh McKean, was promoting in um, uh, public uh, discourse that he was interested in the new scale again. So new scale came up again. And we learned that Xcel Energy had signed a memorandum of understanding with New Scale, and um, so you know it's 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 coming at us so fast. Um, and that the Pueblo commissioners had met with New Scale, and they went to the Public Utilities Commission, and they promoted New Scale to um, uh, as a replacement for Comanche Three. And you know, Denver doesn't get any electricity from Comanche 3. So if a nuclear power plant shows up in Pueblo County again, is it gonna happen the same way that Denver will get the energy, but the community is an environmental justice community. And today, as I said, that was the biggest hit I have ever seen in Colorado legislature. And I have never been a part of it. I have been working on waste issues, certainly nuclear waste at Rocky Flats that's got infinity waste buried at the site right now and people um, are unaware of it. So I wanted to thank you again 
This has been an educational experience watching maybe the Biden grand whole team coming in. I know Hickenlooper had uh, helped get Grand home to uh, speak to Pueblo, but uh, that's an environmental justice community and they deserve better, but but all over the country. And by the way, Okla, I'm, I'm glad you. that you were there. Thank you. And thank you, Okla, for your presentation on what happened to you recently you didn't uh, mention. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Seaman, uh, for sharing your perspectives uh, with us as we... Um, debate this bill. Um, I'll now uh, turn it over to Ms. Uh, Stacey Shin. I apologize. I am probably mispronouncing your name, so please correct me on how best to pronounce it. It's, it's fine. Um, hi, uh, my name is Elisabetta Stachison. I live in Denver, and I represent Indivisible Colorado, a progressive statewide grassroots organization. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, before you decide to study the feasibility of building a small modular reactor in Pueblo, I urge you to first question SMRs more broadly as a viable clean energy alternative and question the assumption that building a small nuclear reactor is something we want in Colorado in the first place. Because small modular reactors are nuclear reactors and they bring with them most of the old challenges associated with nuclear energy. But don't take my word for it. I get my information from the Union of Concerned Scientists who are concerned about SMRs. I encourage you to check out their website. It's ucs.org. The UCS, the Union of Concerned Scientists, have de dedicated a number of reports, articles, and podcasts to this subject because they see SMRs as a false solution. Like all nuclear reactors, SMRs have four major unresolved problems, safety, waste, proliferation, and costs. When accounted for subsidies, nuclear power costs four to five times more than solar power. So even if, if SMRs were to cut nuclear energy costs in half, it would still be at least twice as expensive as solar energy is now. A recent report published by the Union of Concerned Scientists entitled The Cost of Nuclear Power, Cheap Dreams, Expensive Realities, warns us that these risks and costs keep private sector financing scarce so that the government subsidies needed uh, for these projects have to be significant and never ending. SB 2273 is a gateway to a future that would not be cheap would not be safe and is not desired by frontline communities in Pueblo. And just as importantly, does not effectively combat climate change. Because under the most optimistic scenario a nuclear reactor in Pueblo would only begin to generate energy in 10 years. But unfortunately, it begins to draw on our funds right now with the passage of this bill. Bill Gates himself, a fan of SMR admits the technology in theory has potential, but in practice, quote, still has lots and lots of challenges ahead, end of quote. It is frightening to imagine how much our climate, our environment, and likely our fortunes will have changed in the next 10 years. We are running out of time and this bill toys with a treacherous, unnecessary technology that would deliverable, deliver questionable benefits unquestionably late in this crisis. I urge you Thank to you. reflect it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Stasushin. Stasushin. I'm sorry. Stasushin. I'm going to try really hard because I think that that's important. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mark Glenn. He is not online. I'm going to shift then to Ms. Uh, Giselle Herzford. Herzfeld. Welcome to Senate State Affairs. Please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. Madam Chair Gonzalez, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. My name is Giselle Herzfeld, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center and 350 Colorado in opposition to SB 22073. 
The future of energy production is one of the most important and challenging issues we face as a state, a nation, and a global community. The need to rapidly decarbonize our economy and transition to a clean energy source is a deeply urgent matter. It is a matter of life and death for billions of people around the world who will experience the impacts of the climate crisis that is a direct result of the way our economy has derived its energy. Nuclear energy is now being touted as a clean and carbon-free energy source that will transition our economy out of the era of fossil fuels. In Pueblo, Colorado, county commissioners are considering early closure of the Unit 3 coal plant to replace it with small modular nuclear reactors. While I applaud the intent to retire the coal plant early, I believe that a transition to nuclear power would be a grave mistake with consequences that will echo for thousands of future generations. Nuclear power is not a clean energy source. It may be carbon free, but it also generates dangerous waste that will remain radioactive for thousands of years. There is no known method or technology to process this waste effectively, and thus it must be stored as long as it remains radioactive. There is even the possibility that the waste would need to be stored on site. Our state's experience with the nuclear waste contamination at Rocky Flats should alone be enough to dissuade us from pursuing this radioactive energy option. Nuclear meltdowns such as Chernobyl or Fukushima, while exceedingly rare, should also dissuade us from pursuing nuclear power. The unfortunate reality is that climate change will lead to an increase in natural disasters in our state, from floods to fires, which have the potential to create an exponentially more terrifying catastrophe if radioactive material is present. Climate change is also leading to increased drought conditions in our state, making water an increasingly limited and precious resource. According to Professor M. V. Ramana, a single 300 megawatt re reactor operating at 90% capacity would withdraw 160 million to 390 million gallons of water every day, heating it up before discharge. Nuclear plants also use and contaminate massive amounts of water in pools that are 60 feet deep to cool spent nuclear fuel. Our state cannot afford this with fresh water becoming such a limited commodity. Given the rapidly diminishing costs in renewable technologies, which have shown great promise in tackling the climate crisis, a transition to nuclear power would be a ludicrous waste of time, money, and energy for our state. Please oppose SB 73. Thank you for hearing me today. Thank you so much, Ms. Hertzfeld. Uh, colleagues, at this time, I will open up this uh, panel of witnesses for questions from members of the committee. Colleagues, do you have any questions? Seeing none, I want to thank you all so much for sharing your perspectives as we consider this policy. Next, I'm going to call up uh, Usama Khalid, Jan Rose, and Richard Andrews. Welcome to Sun State Affairs. If you could please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. Thank you. Cool. Um, hi, Madam Chair Gonzalez, members of the committee. I would first like to thank you all for allowing me to speak today um, about SB 22073. My name is Usama Khalid. I work with two nonprofits here in Colorado, the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center, and um, a Native and Indigenous organization called Spears of the Sun that's based here in Denver. I'm speaking here today out against SB 22073 due to the irreversible and catastrophic damages that can be caused to our community and surrounding areas. Both my organizations work against situations that can cause the current climate crisis to get any worse or dangerous than it already is. Introducing SMRs puts us in a place where we can be exposed to nuclear waste, something that is radioactive for thousands of years. Nuclear waste is something that is time and time again being dumped into low-income majority BIPOC areas, and it's time we stop sacrificing people of color in the claims of something that everyone here is saying is clean energy. This shortcut to creating a new energy source will not only put us in danger, but also put the generations that follow us at risk. Green renewable energy options exist, and it's time for us to consider those in place of something that can destroy our planet and people. Windscale, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima are all good enough reasons to not want a nuclear power plant built here in Colorado. The disasters that these nuclear plants cause can still be seen today. With more nuclear plants, the chances of getting cancer skyrockets. 
Clusters of cancer cases have been historically known to be found near nuclear power plants and put even those who work in those plants at risk. Our lower and middle class will be at the forefront of those exposed. Something else I would like to take note, um, something else I would like to note is that nuclear plants require the mining of uranium, something that has terrorized the lives of the people of, Nav the people of Navajo Nation for decades and still to this day. Over 500 uranium mines were established on Navajo land, and 30 million tons of uranium was extracted from these mines between 1944 and 1986. Due to lasting contamination in the land, air, and water from these mines, the communities that surround them are still experiencing higher rates of lung and bone cancer, kidney failure, birth defects, and among other health impacts from uranium exposure. Everyone here today kept saying that this is a new clean way of um, getting energy. I think sacrificing black, black and brown people um, with the nuclear waste is not really a clean energy option. Um, I'm letting you guys know that it's time to start taking care and prioritizing our BIPOC and people of color. Please listen to the people who have come to you today. Climate change is something that is also on my mind as a young person, but nuclear power is not a clean energy source. Um, our future is at risk when playing with these dangerous games. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Khalid. Ms. Uh, Jan Rose, welcome to Senate State Affairs. If you can please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jan Rose, and I am here as a volunteer legislative analyst for the Colorado Coalition for a Livable Climate. The CCLC is a 40-member organization of all the environmental orgs you already know in Colorado, uh, plus a number of community and religious organizations. And I'm going to throw another technical term because this particular bill hasn't gotten technical enough. We are chock full of science wonks. <laughs> so, so we have all sorts of um, CSU professors and NREL employees and people from NOAA and stuff that are members of the CCLC. And this bill caused a lot of discussion. We even had a Zoom meeting about it because everything the proponents told you about nuclear energy is true, but what they have not volunteered is what is also true. And what is also true is that the Kemmerer Wyoming plant, which has been on the on the proposal level for three years and is not due to go live until 2029. And when have you ever known a nuclear power plant to be built on time or on budget? Uh, and its budget is $4 billion. And it still has not received either federal um, nuclear or federal energy regulatory approval. So it's got a long ways to go and they keep talking about all of these projects underway, but they're like what they're proposing here for Colorado, their study bills and their hypotheticals. And, you know, the Idaho National Labs, which is like NREL is for us. We all know NREL. It's our DOE facility. Uh, the DOE facility in Idaho is really oriented towards nuclear energy, and they're doing a great job in pushing this technology back uh, forward. Here in Colorado, we're doing a great job in pushing pumped hydro forward. We passed the bill to support pumped hydro last session. We don't need another bill to study pumped hydro. We already passed it. And we're looking at using hydrogen for the Craig plant, which will take the water that's coming down of the route valley and split the hydrogen molecules out of it and then just send it downstream. Uh, and that will keep all the jobs in high paying in the existing Craig power plant. And of course, the Hayden plant is being looked at for molten salt storage. And we passed those bills last year. Those were HB 1312 and SB 264, respectively. So we are making great progress. And I wish that you won't agree to put a $4 billion unnecessary plant on the back of the ratepayers of XL Energy, because that's what New Scale is proposing. And I'm getting enough rate increases as a rate payer. I don't need to pay for a nuclear plant. Thank you so much for your time. That was perfect timing, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and let's see, our last uh, person in this panel is uh, Mr. Richard Andrews. Welcome to Senate State Affairs. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, hello, my name is Rich Andrews. Um, I live in Boulder, Colorado. I'm a um, chemical environmental engineer, have worked in the nuclear industry until I could not do it anymore because it is just plain too dangerous for our population, our environment. Um, I've been involved with nuclear activities for almost 50 years, first with the US EPA in the Denver office, and I was responsible for dealing with all of the uranium mines and mills in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, I, I won't go into any further in that. There, I've submitted written testimony that gives a little more of my background. I want to start out by saying, please read some of the materials I've given you. Um, there's a lot of technical information. This is a very technical topic. Um, nuclear power, even the newer stuff, all these small modular reactors, those are unproven. We haven't built any. There's, there's talk about getting them going by 2030 or thereabouts, but that is a pipe dream. That hasn't, we haven't built a new nuclear plant in this country in several decades. Some of them are still under construction and they've been under construction for 10 to 15 years. They're just not happening. Um, nuclear power has never been economically profitable. It's always been propped up by all kinds of bennies from the federal government. One of the big bennies was that the federal government took responsibility for the waste. And what have they done? They have never resolved that problem, and they've had 80 years to do it. Nuclear power has, has always been connected with nuclear waste and, in fact, nuclear weapons. There are plants that are operating that provide materials for both, even in our country, in the Tennessee Valley Authority. I'm going to dwell on, and I'd ask you to look in your handouts for this particular item. This, I, I conducted about 10 years ago, a very detailed study of nuclear waste and what can happen with an, a terrorist attack on a plant. The, the terrorists who attacked the World Trade Center and the Pentagon actually looked at attacking the very same plant that I have evaluated. I, get, I ask you to look at it. It would have wiped out everything down to, from New York City all the way to Philadelphia as uninhabitable. Think about it. Is that what thank we you, want sir. to promote? Thank you very much, sir. And thank you for sharing with, all of, um, with us all of these um, documents. I will ask uh, Ms. Wallace, to add this to um, the official uh, record re pertaining to the bill. Um, I do want to see if there are any questions um, for any of the witnesses um, who have uh, offered their testimony. Seeing none, um, I will. I want to thank you all for sharing your thoughts. And now I'd like to bring up Ms. Lynn Siegel. And, oh, you are signed up twice. All right. Um, Ms. Siegel, welcome to Senate State Affairs. Please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. I can't believe it. I get my own video. This is just not like Boulder. Yay. So <laughs> happy. And please let Leslie Glassstrom speak. I, it was really hard to get on, but I did. And I stayed on through the whole city council meeting too and was able to testify there with both of you going. It was amazing because you could turn the volume down. But anyway, so what I wanted to say is it's really completely irrelevant about climate change if we're all dead from contamination. 
I speak from experience. My mother died at 38 years old. I'm 68. I was 16. My brother was 15 and one was five. And from plutonium, Rocky Flats, when we lived here in 57 in the biggest fire. And then she died in 69, the Mother's Day fire. Like, so personally, it's very home to me that death comes before climate change. The planet doesn't care if we combat climate change. If we kill off humanity first, that's a problem. Now, lots of people were testifying that this brings jobs. Well, there are many more diverse jobs that come from subsidizing the renewable energy, distributive generation, not even transmissive generation, and um, reactive um, energy and microgrids and battery systems. It's kind of like a, a circuit that you create, but it's with, with urban centers and, and it balances the load and it's so much more effective and so much less costly in the human, the human factor of this contamination, which cannot be contained even with small nuclear reactors. It just can't be contained. There's no place is a way, you know, like when you do the trash. Um, here I am in my bed all cozy all winter long, 47 degrees. That's how dedicated I'm waiting until we get off of Excel Energy. We get the PUC allows us. We aren't paying all this extra money, and we can municipalize ourselves in Boulder and get our own sources of renewables, very good sources of renewables. Um, let's see. Um, so for our whole economy, um, this is so much better. Um, so so much greater diverse jobs and you know we don't want jobs that are going to come from can, trying to contain this waste because those are endless jobs we can't we can't ever do it um let's see the pay rate we've got plenty of good plain paying jobs thank you balancing the load reactive energy just thank you that. very much Thank you so much. And thanks for the video. Yay. I love this. And and sorry, um, I don't Thank know you. Name, but I don't go by madam. That's kind of old fashioned way. But I didn't know your name, Gallegos. Oh, sorry. I'm Julie Gonzalez. Hi. Oh, Gonzalez. Um, Julie. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Miss Siegel. Um I um uh, that is a, that concludes the list of individuals who had signed up to testify, but I am curious if there is anyone else either in the audience or online who wishes to testify uh, in opposition to this policy. Um, Leslie uh, Glusson wrote in on chat and on QA if you can find her and send her a link or I can forward her my link if that helps. Uh, thank you, Ms. Siegel. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, let Mr. Katzal um, see if there's anyone else who wishes to testify regarding the policy. Thank you. I see a Leslie Gilstrom. Gilstrom.
Ms. Gilstrom, welcome to Senate State Affairs. Thank you for your perseverance. Please state your name, any organization you represent, and proceed to testimony. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, one of the members of the committee, thank you so very much. My name is Leslie Glustrom, G-L-U-S-T-R-O-M. And when the meeting got, uh, when the committee meeting got switched, I didn't think I could testify. And then I heard that the meeting was running late tonight. And I really want to thank you all so much for staying late, for giving such serious consideration to this bill. I really appreciate that the sponsors are thinking about low carbon generation but I wanna urge a no vote on this bill. It really, we have to be really careful now about false solutions and also about spending money that we need, don't need to spend because we kind of know the answer already um, that these small modular reactors are highly unlikely to be ever be able to so add significant uh, benefit to our effort to address climate change. And there's kind of three misconceptions that I'd like to address. The first one is that because we needed baseload electricity, by way of background, I've spent a lot of time at the Utilities Commission, close to the last 20 years. I've spent a lot of time at the Utilities Commission in dozens of proceedings. Um, and so I come with that perspective. I spend most of my time over at the Utilities Commission. One of the first misconceptions is that baseload because we, that's how we did things in the 20th century, that's how we're gonna do things in the 21st century. And that's a misconception because as we move to more wind and solar, what we really need are really highly flexible resources. Baseload by definition is the opposite. Nuclear is often held up as, oh, this'll be our next baseload. And one of the ways we say it among the wonks is that, Base load is to utilities in the 21st century what typewriters are to newspapers. People like me are old enough to remember you couldn't possibly put out a newspaper without a lot of typewriters. And now if you brought a typewriter into any newspaper, they would just look at you like, oh, where have you been? And that's kind of the way it is with base load. So that's the first misconception. The second other two misconceptions have been addressed in, in depth. So I'll just mention them briefly. The second one is that somehow this is gonna be a safe way to do it. And I, I'm a chemist by training. There's nothing safe about the, the, the radioactive life cycle from the mining to the processing to the using it. As a mother and a grandmother, I'm just appalled that we're gonna leave all this radioactive waste for our kids and our grandkids. And the third is the cost effectiveness. Hopefully you know about the horrible cost overruns on the nuclear plants all around the country and around the world. So I'm urging a no vote on this bill. I wanna thank you all again for the long evening. And I, and I thank the sponsors for thinking about low carbon alternatives, but let's not do false solutions. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your perspectives uh, with us. Colleagues, any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you um, uh, for signing up. And all right, at this time, is there anyone else who wishes to testify with any position in regards to uh, Senate Bill 73? Seeing none, the witness portion of this hearing is concluded. Colleagues, we're gonna stand in a super brief senatorial five. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. You did call on me, didn't you? I wasn't quite sure what you...
opposition to this policy. I think this is a pretty um, fascinating uh, point of policy. And um, I also recognize uh, that we are uh, missing a member at the moment. Um, and so um, I've uh, spoken with uh, Senator Rankin, our bill sponsor, and he has graciously allowed for us to, um, we're going to lay this bill over uh, for action uh, in both, and we'll keep the amendment phase open and we'll keep um, the bill phase open. Um, I'm sorry, the, the final action uh, on the policy open um, so that we can uh, reconvene uh, at a later date. I'll go ahead and I will um, move this to the 17th, um, if that works, um, for us to uh, reconsider this policy. But I really do want to just extend my appreciation to everyone who has um, shared their perspectives with us on this bill. Senator Rankin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, very courteous of you to do that. I, I would like to make a few comments since they're fresh on our mind of uh, listening to the uh, testimony. I, I guess, you know, if if we really believe that climate change is an existential threat, which we hear, then how can we not look at every option? I mean, how can we not fill our toolbox with every possible tool? So, you know, I start with that thought. And, you know, I, I was listening to the testimony and, uh, you know, I, I found it very interesting in both sides. But I think, you know, I, I want to point out that the opposition has declared the debate to be over. And as an engineer, you know, long career, it's hard for me to accept. I think that there are some serious questions out there the questions of waste management is not settled. You know, comparing this to Rocky Flats and, and, you know, a terrorism attack is not relevant. So what I heard was that the debate's over. We don't need to do the study. We need to look no further because we already know what's, you know, that, that nuclear and pumped hydro is a part of this. And, and I accept that that's already on the table. Um, but to assume that the debate's over is just not good science. It's not common sense because science changes. Small modular reactors of the future are not the big nuclear plants of the past in any regard. In the safety, the operation, the waste management, it's not relevant. So then I listened to the proponents and they were talking about answering questions, which is what this is about. Now, I also heard comments that sounded like we were gonna build a nuclear reactor in downtown Denver tomorrow. We are not, that's not what this is. You know, it would be a long time before we ever make a decision to put a small modular reactor. But I do envision that because I re look, I represent most of the coal mines in the state. I represent Hayden and Craig. I think about a small reactor, perhaps two of them, replacing those big plants and fueling those power lines. So yes, I do envision that in the future, but that's not what this is. This is not a decision to build a nuclear reactor. It is not. And, and, and I heard comments that sounded like that's what we were doing here. So I just want to make that as clear as possible. You know, we heard, we heard from people across the board, proponents, Democrats, Republicans, and I'm sure not a lot of non-affiliated people. Definitely not a partisan issue. We heard climate activists as proponents of the bill. We heard economics, we heard college professors, we heard students, I mean, so such a wide spectrum of people. So I'm just impressed that this should be a nonpartisan issue. It should be open to investigation. We should answer questions instead of assume, assuming that we already have the answers. Why would we not be open to all solutions? Why, why not? Why are we so obsessed with solar and wind in this state that we can't consider other alternatives? 
Do we believe in a just transition so that, in fact, we might provide jobs and, and, you know, a future for the folks who've dedicated their lives to energy? Now, so I hope that we can digest this before we come back for a vote, perhaps some other discussions. In terms of amendments, which I'll hold over, I have an amendment prepared if the committee so desires to move this over to the Colorado Energy Office or anywhere else. I thought, and the reason I put it no edit, I think it's about half economic development and half energy. And, you know, I, not to be too critical, but our energy office has not expressed a lot of interest in looking at nuclear. They've been focused on wind and solar. So I thought making it an economic, you know, focus might have merit. And that's why I wanted to put it there. So thank you very much for listening. I know it was a long night, but I hope it was valuable on both sides of the equation, and I look forward to continued discussions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Rankin, thank you for bringing such a, um, an interesting policy for us to, um, to debate and to consider. Um, in light of uh, us being down a member, I'm gonna go ahead and lay this bill over uh, to the 17th uh, for further action. But I really do appreciate um, you giving us uh, your perspectives and also giving us a heads up on um, some potential amendments. Thank you. Um, we stand in adjournment. Y'all get home safe and appreciate all of your work today.